and it is really good. Like, it is so good. If you know, you know. Pour over every morning. Do you ever just want a book to end? Have a break. <sighs> Dinner is served for the night. Quick, easy, effective. All day, baby. All day. Guys, we are having some real wild weather. I don't know what is going on, but it was 72 degrees in February yesterday, and today it is 30 degrees, and we have wind advisories, and I see snow on the forecast, so such is life in the Midwest. In the spring, here we are, and here I am, again, complaining about the weather. I'm gonna get you guys propped up here so we can do a little book check-in together. Settle it, everyone. Let's talk about The Atlas Paradox and where I'm at. I did not have time to check in with you guys at all yesterday. It was just such a busy day between coaching and work and blah, 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 you know, my story and editing. Oh my gosh, the editing. So I just finished the most recent vlog, which is currently uploading onto YouTube, hopefully without issue because it is the longest vlog that I have ever done. Every every week now I'm doing these, I'm like, I really love doing these vlogs. I think I'm gonna keep doing this. And then they just keep getting longer and longer because I keep talking more and more. I didn't really get to read much yesterday because of all the editing and everything I was doing um, outside of just normal things. But I did read a little bit last night and I sat down for a while this morning and read as much as I could. So I am currently on page 296, which means I have just about 100 pages left of this. And I, I have mixed feelings. It did get a little bit better as I was reading. As I previously stated, the first part of the book where they were kind of being initiated, like officially initiated into the society was moving kind of slow for me and I was having a hard time grasping everything. And then once I got past that, it seemed like I was starting to almost absorb what was going on a little bit better. So we are still following all of our candidates that are now part of the society. And during this part of the year, they've picked their independent study, what they are going to be finishing out the rest of the year, spending their time on. And it is interesting because each person is going to be drawn to study something different and they are going to study something different based on the type of powers that they contain themselves. We've also started this book with one of our main characters, Libby, having gone missing at the end of book one. Spoiler, you know, this is not going to be a spoiler free vlog. So we are bouncing back and forth between all of the characters that are still at the society and then also Libby, who has been like transported to another time completely. And so we're getting her point of view from where she has gone missing to as well as everybody else who's still at the manor of the society and trying to figure out what exactly happened to her. So along with doing their own studies and providing their own feedback and basically giving back to this library and the archives throughout their year of study, they are also trying to figure out what happened to her. So we ended the first book with kind of a big surprise of what some of our other main characters were bringing to this story. So we have Atlas Blakely, who is kind of like maybe the proctor of everybody. He is like the head of maintaining the society and the initiates that come in. But we have discovered that he might actually have some diabolical plans in regards to what should be happening with the society. He then was working in tandem with another initiate from back in the day when he was initiate for the society. And they have over like the last 30 years been working to try to put together the best of the best to help kind of dissolve this whole situation in general. So none of the candidates that are here now know any of this. They kind of get weird vibes from Atlas. Like there's maybe something 
kind of hidden or secret about him. And one of the candidates is actually able to get into the archives and get some information about Atlas that we don't even know about yet. He's kind of kept to himself. And all of the other members know that this candidate has found some information on him as well and that he's just not sharing it with anybody. So there's some secrecy already surrounding Atlas that they might know about, but they don't really know exactly what it is. We have Libby who has gone missing and we're following her point of view. And then we also just have the candidates themselves dealing with what they are studying and learning more about the archives and what the archives actually are. So this secret library of Alexandria, the one that has been missing to mankind, isn't just a library full of books. They're starting to see that it is this sentient being. It has feelings or it has thoughts and it will either allow them to read certain material or deny them access to certain material. And they're also trying to figure out why and how the library works the way it does. And it does feel like it's dragging a little bit. It feels very substantial in the sense of like, you feel like you're just learning more and more about each person. Some of these people are kind of breaking off into groups and working together, but you don't feel like you're necessarily like, getting anywhere yet like I only have 100 pages left of this book and I, I don't know what's going to happen like I don't know what their end goal really is for this book I do enjoy it because I it, it sucked me in in the sense where I'm like now getting very invested into each of these characters um I was thinking that this book was going to be much more about the characters and exactly what drives them to be the way that they are and it really is doing that also their dynamic with the library or the archives itself is kind of coming into play. Like why does the library only allow certain people to see certain things? And it is because of the type of Medeans they are or the type of magic that they contain. We do now also have this dynamic of what is going to happen with Atlas. Like what was he trying to do by getting this group of this like specific group of people together? And are they going to find out that Atlas has more up his sleeve than they are just spending the year here studying and trying to give back to the archives with their own knowledge? Also, the reason Libby went missing in the first place was because her boyfriend, da da da, is the friend of Atlas from like 30 years ago when he was an initiate and he was in on this plan the whole time. Now that we are here, Atlas is kind of like gone off and he's doing his own thing and he doesn't necessarily want to keep the same plans that they have been plotting and scheming for the last like three decades and gone kind of rogue and he's got something else to, like up his sleeve and this friend doesn't know exactly what it is. So because this friend got so emotionally invested in Libby, he pulled her out of the house like literally physically pulled her out and traveled her because he's a time traveler into a totally different time to try to keep her safe from what is going to end up happening. Even though it hasn't flowed like quite as easily or as well, I still want to see how it ends and I want to read book three because I think this is that second book. It's the middle book. It's the one where all of the meat is so full of information that I I'm hoping book three would be like, boom, hit the ground running and smooth sailing to see how this entire series basically ends. So anyways, another very long check-in. I wanted to give you a pretty decent update because I didn't get to talk to you guys yesterday. So that's why this one is even longer than normal. Um, I'm going to finish some work meetings now. Then if all is well this afternoon, sit down and read a little bit more. I'd like to finish this book by tomorrow. Tomorrow is the last day of February and I would like to finish books like on the last day of a month if at all possible. I know that's really weird but it's part of my OCD personality. So if we can get this wrapped up by tonight tomorrow, I'll be one happy girl. And then eventually we'll do a little bit of book shopping because we're going to have to pick up some books for the March TBR, which I am currently working on as well. 
And as I said, um, last weekly vlog is dropping today. So if you want to go back and get a little bit more information about me finishing the Atlas Six and then reading Allie Hazelwood's Check and Mate, which was just probably so far my favorite read of the year. I know it's only two months in. So that will be dropping sometime today. Go back and watch that. And about to head into a meeting in T minus four minutes. So I'm going to let you guys go so I can go and do that. We'll head to the gym here in a little bit and then hopefully sit down and read a little bit this afternoon. So I will check in with you guys later. I'm so far away from home. I wish you guys could have seen that big stretch. In this desert of regrets Never thought that I would have to let you go Tell me how can I forget If I could travel back in time I'd lay a blanket full of stars To brighten up the darkness of our sleepless nights just want a book to end like that's about where I'm at with the Atlas Paradox and I'm kind of bummed about it I have like 20 pages left so I'll update you guys when I'm done hi you guys wanted to do a quick check-in with you for Thursday afternoon we are down in the studio because I just got done filming my March TBR so I figured I would just um, turn the camera on for my last check-in on the Atlas Paradox because I finished it this morning and I, I have thoughts. I have feelings. I really just did not like it as much as the first book. That's the, it's really the only thing I can say. Um, the first book just really sucked me in. The writing style was the same, so I don't know what happened there. I think it's honestly, it was just the storyline. So at the end of book one, Libby goes missing. We start book two with the initiates finishing their first year. One of their friends has gone missing, and now they no longer have to sacrifice a candidate because technically one is gone. So boom, done, check it off the list. The society will be happy with that. So we go through this entire book where we now have five people that are supposed to be studying something and I can't even really tell you exactly what each person decided to study. It seemed very like brushed over and all of a sudden an entire like eight months has gone by and they're like, oh shit, we were going to help you look for Libby. We totally forgot about that. Like we've been kind of busy, but like, we're totally here to help you now though, man. Like let's get this figured out. So the premise of this book was supposed to be bring Libby back and also study these certain topics. And it felt like we never really talked that much about either of those things. So there's that. Also, this like major diabolical plan that Atlas had going on in the background that um, some of them didn't really know about, but then like one of them kind of did and he wasn't really sharing the information until like the very, very end of the book. Like one candidate in this story had private information about Atlas and he did not speak it until like his last point of view in the book. And I was like, oh my God, I've read 380 pages and I just now figured out what like was sad about Atlas and his file and the archives. I don't know. It just seemed like nothing happened. <laughs> like that's the only way I can describe it. And I'm so bummed because man, I was like raging to get my hands on this one and continue on with the story. And it really just fell flat for me and I'm kind of bummed. And I looked up the third book. Doesn't have really good reviews, which I try not to do because I've loved so many books with bad reviews and I feel like if you really take those to heart, you could miss out on some things that you would really enjoy. I mean, reading is so subjective. Um, I, I'm just going to take a break. So we have wrapped up the Atlas Paradox. I didn't 
mind how it ended. I will say that much. I was kind of pleased with the way it ended um, because it obviously set itself up for book three, which we already know is a thing. I do want to see how the series ends in general. I just need a break from the writing. It felt very hard to get into in the very beginning. I had like this itty bitty section where I felt like I was kind of jiving and then it really like hit the brakes on me again and I was kind of like something's gonna happen, right? Like something that's going to happen. And I don't know. It just felt like nothing really did. I am, however, super excited because I put all of my information together for my March TBR video. Don't we love a new month? Oh God, there's like just month by month if you do a TBR. It feels so refreshing. You're like, mm, I've turned a new leaf. I'm a new me. And I'm just like doing the same old shit that I always do. I went through my TBR a little bit and kind of was trying to figure out what I wanted to read um, after kind of taking a break from the Atlas 6 series. And I put my March TBR list together and I was like, oh, you know what I'm going to grab because I've been also thinking about it since I read the first book was Box Club by Adeline Grace. So my friends, for the rest of this vlog through this weekend, we are going to be starting Box Club together. I am very excited about this. Belladonna is the first book and I read that in the fall of 2023 and here we are almost in spring. If you have not read Belladonna, I highly recommend it. If you like Bridgerton but with like gothic vibes, chef's kiss. The story is so beautiful. I love it so so much. We follow a main character named Signa who touched by death from the moment she's born basically in her whole life she is followed around by death literally followed around by death so she becomes an orphan when she's a baby because everybody around her dies but she has left this inheritance from her family that she will claim once she comes of age so as an orphan she keeps getting bounced around from family member to family member and everybody takes her in in hopes that they will be able to keep her until she's old enough and they will also get to get their hands on this inheritance that she's supposed to claim However, everybody around her dies. So even the people that care for her that she ends up loving and enjoying her time with always end up dead. So we start the book after her whole family has died and now she is almost 18. She is living with an aunt or something like that and her aunt is just an, a horrible person, like wretched person to her. She is basically just biding her time there until she can get her inheritance and live on her own. But lo and behold, her aunt kicks the bucket and she's on her own again. Comes out that she has some like extended family somewhere that is willing to take her in as a ward and she is going to live the rest of her young adult life. So she is transported to this very gothic manner where she gets to start um, building a relationship with cousins that she's never had before and she starts to let herself open up a little bit and care for these people. Her one cousin, her female cousin, is actually very ill and Signa is extremely worried because she knows that if history is to repeat itself, someone in her life is going to pass away, but she really doesn't want her young cousin to have to see the end of her life. So as the story goes on, she starts to build a relationship with her family and then also with death as well. So death becomes even more prominent now that she's kind of becoming an adult. They start to develop a relationship with each other. He explains to her exactly how they have crossed paths, why he is so prevalent in her life and like what she means to him. And they actually start to like become a thing. And it is really good. Like, it is so good. It is a young adult book. So the spice level is very mild, but the romance starts to build after like you get towards the end of the book. And I was like, oh my gosh, I am eating this up. This is another typical story about a girl who has kind of like lived her young life being kind of meek and mild mannered, especially because all of all of the things that happen around her. And as the story goes on, she is getting a little bit older, not just in age, but in maturity. And she's trying to keep her family safe that she now has built a relationship with and cares for. She's trying to navigate this relationship that she has with death 
And also, what is she going to do, like, once she becomes an official adult and she can finally go out on her own? I really enjoyed how the first book ended. I'm excited to see where we pick up in book two. So I'm going to start this either tonight or tomorrow. It's an early coaching day tomorrow, so I do have to get to bed kind of early. Um, and I am currently editing my March TBR video as we speak, so I will see if I even get to this tonight but tomorrow for sure. And then we will read a little bit of this through the weekend together. And I'm so excited because this story is just so deliciously gothic and macabre and the setting is beautiful. So just wanted to do a check-in because I have officially finished the second book in this series. Going to be starting the second book in this series and taking you guys along with me. This weekend should be nice and fun. Um, a lot going on at the gym this weekend. If you are in the CrossFit world at all, you know that the Open starts this weekend. For those of you that aren't in the world, that will mean absolutely nothing to you. Those of you that kind of know what I mean, it's going to be a busy weekend. So I might give you guys a little sneak peek about what's going on at the gym this weekend. It's a very like big community event happening for the next three weeks. So yeah, I will just check in with you guys as soon as I can. Until then, I'll see you later. Hitting those midday walkies. What? Hey, Bobby. Good morning, everybody. It is super early. It's 5.40 right now in the morning. Um, we've got a super busy day at the gym, helping with some stuff there. So I'm up, well, I mean, I usually get up around 5.30 anyways, but I'm up early today too. Um, so I can get some reading in before we go. I didn't really get to read much yesterday besides yesterday morning. So um, because it's going to be busy later, I wanted to do a check-in with you guys now on where I'm at. So for box glove, I'm just about 100 pages in and I just am so happy to be back in this world. I forgot like how gothic the setting is and it's like I knew that in my head and why I kind of wanted to read it because I was just I was craving something like that again. But we pick right back up where we left off from book one. So Sigma is at a party at her uncle's manor and someone, lo and behold, accidentally gets poisoned and ends up dying. And then her uncle is accused of the murder. So he is immediately like taken to jail. And now Sigma and her cousin Blythe, who was sick in the first book, are trying to work to prove his innocence because they know he had nothing to do with it. Fate is also part of this one, which I totally forgot about. So Cigna is already um, involved with death and has like this relationship with death, but fate also comes into the picture as well. And he is death's brother and fate is like up to no good. And he is basically at the helm of all of the stuff happening because he has realized that Cigna is the woman that death loves and fate has this long standing rivalry with his brother and I believe they said it was over another woman so it seems like fate is going to be out to destroy the thing that his brother loves which is Cigna. So basically where I'm at right now is Signa was invited to a party at this other palace called Wisteria something or other. When she gets there, she realizes that the prince of this palace is fate. So that's where I'm at right now. And her, her cousin Blythe went with her. So they are at this party and they're hoping that they can um, spread the word and try to prove the innocence of Cigna's uncle. So that's where I'm at right now. Um, I know a lot of detail and again these aren't going to be spoiler free. I'm going to be telling you what is happening in these books and my thoughts and feelings on them but so far I just love it so much just like I knew I would. It's very easy to read. Um, it's another one of those books where you kind of just get lost in. It's, it's almost got, she's got kind of like that Stephanie Garber type writing where you feel like you're in a fairy tale a little bit, but this is just much more gothic and it is, oh, I'm telling you what, if you love an atmospheric gothic setting, these books are for you. <laughs> I just wanted to do a quick check-in on where I'm at. I'll try to get some reading done this afternoon. 
um, after we have like our whole morning thing at the gym and I apologize for the lighting. You know, this lighting situation is never ideal, but it is super early. My husband is still asleep, so I'm trying to also be quiet. So if the audio is not great, either that is why, but, um, just wanted to check in before we get the day started. So, all right, I will check in with you guys as soon as I have another update. Bye. <laughs> checking with you it is the afternoon now the weekend has just absolutely flown by with all of the stuff that we've got going on at the gym and I was going to give you guys a peek at that yesterday and it just ended up being kind of like madness in there so anyways wanted to do a reading check-in on where I'm at in foxglove still really enjoying it it's just such a cute I don't know it's just so atmospheric and that's the only way I can describe this book and very gothic it's very like I want to describe it as Once Upon a Broken Heart, but more of a gothic setting. So if you like Stephanie Garber's writing, this is very similar to me. It has that kind of whimsical fairy tale like writing style, but in a gothic setting. I am currently on page 270. So I've been able to chip away at quite a bit this weekend. Um, and I think the last time we spoke, I had mentioned that fate is a part of this book as well. So at the end of book one, we see Signa kind of develop her relationship with death and understand why her and death have always been able to communicate with each other and have always kind of like he's always been a part of her life. She discovered that she was part reaper, which is why she was able to see ghosts growing up and have the communication that she has with death. So fast forward, we are starting this book off that her uncle has been accused of a murder that happened at an event that they were having at Thorn Grove, and they have been trying to figure out who the actual murderer is. Fate was at that party originally and kind of pointed the finger at Cygna's uncle, which is how he ended up behind bars. And she very quickly realized that fate was going to be a major problem for her going forward. And he has proven to be. As time has gone on, she has spent a little more time with fate because he was vying for her attention so much. He relayed to her that she not only has these powers that a reaper has, she also has the powers of someone who has passed away long ago, which was his one true love, life. Signa doesn't believe him whatsoever. She's like, I'm madly in love with death. He's my one true love. I don't want anything to do with you. Please go away. And Fate's like, no, no, no. I promise you, I am going to make you see over time that you are the woman that I used to be in love with, reincarnated, and you're going to start remembering these things, and then you're going to fall in love with me over my brother. So now she's being pulled in these two different directions where she's trying to keep fate at bay and also trying to continue to spend time and develop her relationship with death. But also the main point of this is trying to find out who murdered this duke in the beginning of the story and how to get her uncle out of prison. She has grown very, very close to her cousin Blythe since she is no longer sick and she's up, like out and about and kind of part of society again and able to do all these things with Signa and she's very very determined to also try to figure out how to get her father out of prison so her and Signa this whole time have really grown close trying to work together as a team kind of sleuthing out this whole case. Blythe has always loved her cousin and she's grown so close to her even more but now that they've spent so much time together she has also started to see some very telltale signs that Signa is very much different. For Signa 
She has finally found this family that she truly cares for. She's doing nothing but trying to get her uncle out of prison, protect her cousin and keep her safe while still dealing with like fate and death at the same time. And now she has been banished from the home that she finally made. So I've ended here with Cigna finally getting to her home of Foxglove where it is like kind of dilapidated. It's been empty for the last 20 years. Well, she, they, like it's been sitting empty until she has come of age and able to claim her estate. So she gets there and now she's discovering that Foxglove Manor is completely full of ghosts. All of the ghosts that happened to die the night when she was a baby 20 years ago are still occupants of this house. And that's where I left off this morning. So we're seeing a lot of internal battles with Cigna. You feel so bad for her sometimes because she's really just trying to do her best. She's like, okay, first of all, I was real happy a few months ago when I finally discovered that I'm a reaper. That's totally what I am. All this stuff makes sense. I love death. We're going to somehow make this work. And we're going to have a relationship. My cousin is nice and healthy. Everything is good and happy. Well, now fate has come into the picture and is making her question everything she thought she knew. And now her cousin Blythe has completely pushed her away because she feels betrayed and she is on her own again in her very own house. And she just feels very defeated. So I left the, off there with her finally getting to Fox Glove Manor, her true home. And I'm excited to see what happens from here. Um... Cigna is a very strong-headed character, which is also nice. So Death will sometimes tell her, like, be careful with fate. Like, don't trust him. Don't do things with him. And she's like, okay, gotcha. And then she'll, like, turn around and make a deal with fate because she's trying to help the people around her. So she's definitely very stubborn and strong-willed, but you can see that she's kind of getting deflated from all of these situations that have happened around her. So I think we are kind of like in our third act breakup scene where her and Blythe have kind of like separated from each other and she's going to have to try to fight to prove that she really is this good person and has done all of these things out of the goodness of her heart. It's absolutely beautiful here today, so I think we're probably gonna do some family walkies, but I will be sitting down to read this afternoon. At some point this week, we'll probably have to do a bookstore run to grab my next book for the month of March. So I will take you guys along with me at some point this week to do that as well. Hope you guys have had an amazing weekend and I will check in with you as soon as I can. All right, bye. How do I deal with what I'm feeling? Maybe I just don't. I just don't. What you're doing, I'm in ruins all alone. I'm all alone. I'm all alone. And I know nothing to do. Helps me forget about you. You just came out of the blue. If you only know. God, it is like torrentially downpouring out of nowhere. It's like such weird weather so early in the year. What do you think, Bobby? What's the weather doing? Hi, hello. I just gave you a sneak peek of the weather outside because it is absolutely wild. And I was like, Oh, I'm going to just uh, finish wrapping some things up and then do my last reading check-in for the vlog. And then it just started downpouring out of nowhere and the lighting became really terrible. So I apologize about that. But the overhead lighting is worse. So natural rainy lighting for the win for this check-in. So exciting news. I sat down this morning and finished Foxglove by Adeline Grace. 
and I really enjoyed it. This was definitely, the, this book was longer than Belladonna and you could kind of feel that. Um, there was like a little bit in the middle where it felt like it was, like you kind of wanted things to progress a little more quickly, but I think it was because we started getting introduced to multiple POVs kind of about halfway through the book. Um, and then towards the end of the book. So we are hearing from Cigna, first and foremost, and then as the book goes on, we start to get Blythe's point of view as well. So her cousin that was sick in the entire first book now has her own point of view in this book as well. And I believe the last I left off with you guys, Cigna had just gotten to Foxglove and she discovered that the entire manor was full of all of the ghosts that had died there 20 years prior the at the ball that took her parents lives as well and then she was kind of dealing with that situation she had become estranged from her cousin Blythe because Blythe had discovered that she had a hand in what happened to her brother Percy at the end of book one and Blythe was very very upset about it she felt very betrayed she's been trying this whole time just to get her father out of prison and she's been mourning the death of her brother and she's like wow the one person that I put all my faith in had something to do with that. So also fate was a part of this book as well and fate was bound and determined to make Cigna believe or see that she was his long lost love that has been dead for years and years and years. So now he thinks Cigna is the reincarnation of her. He is going to make her see that she actually loves him and not death and Cigna is like absolutely not. I'm 100% in love with death and I want nothing to do with you. Fate literally weaves what happens to everybody in the world. Like he decides what happens to people in the world. So she is like, if I make a deal with him and finally succumb to him thinking that I'm his one true love, but make the deal that he is going to have to release my uncle and take care of this family that I have grown to love so, so much, then I will do it. Cigna holds a ball at Foxglove, so it's like this whole thing coming full circle. She is now in charge of Foxglove Manor. She's holding a ball where 20 years previously a ball had happened and all of the people had died. And she is bringing together all of the people that she truly cares for in her new home. And fate is being one of them, and she is going to make the deal with him to try to get her uncle released from prison. So now they're all finally back together at Foxglove Manor. We have Cigna, we have Blythe, we have Fate, and we have Death, and we're at this helm of the story. Like, what is going to happen? Is Cigna going to make this deal? Is she going to put all of her own thoughts and feelings aside again because she loves and cares for Death so much? All she wants is a life with him, but she's willing to strike this deal with Fate and basically bind herself to him to free this family that she loves even though her cousin still thinks that she's this awful person, she still, at the end of the day, cares so much for Blythe, she's willing to make this deal with fate and give Blythe someone back in her family that she cares for. Blythe starts to see the error of her ways, and she has been kind of pushed and manipulated a little bit by fate throughout this story, and she finally kind of starts to see exactly the type of person that Cigna is. A little bit of a twist happens at the end. I'm not going to say exactly what happens. I know this has been spoilery up until this point, but I'm not going to give the ending of the book away. But a little bit of a twist does happen, and I, I want to say, like, yeah, I kind of could see that happening, but also I was like, I really like the way that that ended. I am so excited for book three to come out because we kind of ended with, like, this deal being struck. And not just that, we saw these characters grow even more. So Cigna, from the start of this book, was like, I am so excited to finally know what I am, what my powers mean, and I know that I have this family that I love and care for and this man that I love and care for. My life is finally becoming the life I've always wanted to be. And she was constantly pushed and tested throughout this book by fate and by the people around her about her really knowing who she is and questioning who she thought she was. We also see Blythe come forward and really come into her own. She's very smart and very cunning and she's very strong-willed and you watch her develop into this character that went from like so meek and mild because she was literally on her deathbed in book one to this girl that is willing to fight for everything she loves. And her and Cigna together were kind of like this dynamic duo that were gonna like basically sleuth out this entire murder 
situation and then you see their relationship get tested and then how they kind of come back to each other in the end. I think this second book was so wonderfully plotted with character growth and development and not just that like the the initiation of fate into the story and him kind of pushing against death and really the all the other characters he's this like very conniving kind of evil character in the story also he is just someone who wants the love of his life back so it's all very like emotional every character in this book like loves something or someone and just wants finally to have that thing in their life that makes them happy but they're all constantly pushed and you almost see like what they're willing to do for that thing that they love so I really enjoyed the second book. I thought that the writing was kind of romantic. And again, it's it gives you that Stephanie Garber, like fairy tale feeling, but also just a little more dark and macabre. I mean, you've got talk of death and spirits and what people look like when they're dead and communicating with the dead and bringing things back to life and who deserves death and who doesn't. So you have some kind of macabre topics being thrown into this like world of like beautiful balls and manners and flowers and gardens and garden parties and dance cards. So it's like Bridgerton meets a gothic novel. I just like ate up the setting of this book. But with all that being said, we have read in this week quite a bit together. So this book itself was 450 pages. I think I started the, the blog with 100 to 200 pages of Atlas Paradox left. So we've read over 500 pages together in this vlog. It has been a very long week, a very busy week with all of my extracurricular activities. So I am very happy with what I was able to complete in this vlog and to take you guys along with me. I think we're gonna end this vlog here and then start fresh this week, probably with another bookstore shopping trip because I have to pick up my next book. And then we can start fresh with a brand new book and see how far we can get in that one together. With that being said, if you guys enjoyed this vlog, please, as always, hit that like button down below. And if you want to make sure that you don't miss any upcoming weekly vlogs, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. It always helps a girl out. And also let me know what you guys are up to. What have you been reading? What are you reading this week? What did you read last week? What's on your March TBR? Anything good you think I should be putting on my March TBR? Or have you read any of the books that I finished in this vlog? Let me know your thoughts on those books as well. If you have made it this far in the vlog, go ahead and leave the lilac emoji just because it kind of reminds me of the whole setting of this book in general. Thank you guys so much for joining me on this weekly vlog. I can't wait to see you guys in the next one.